I all invite you in the next days to listen to each other, to share, to get inspired, and to use our joint creativity to formulate some questions and possible answers and actions in the next days, and especially to meet this new group of friends to build trust, solidarity, and openness towards each other. But first, we will now have our minds provoked by Shahidul Alam, and I'm exercising to get your, noun, your name uh, pronounced properly. The Bangladesh reclaimed photographer and initiator of the first photo festival in Bangladesh, who I'm so honored uh, that he can be here with us today. So the floor is all yours. Gosh, it, it's a full house. That's always nice. Well, Albert, Annabelle, Inga, Mark at the back, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. It's not my first time, but I, I hope I won't need seduction. I'll be here. Uh, thank you, Lara, uh, for all the work behind the scenes and, and for the friends. We don't, yeah. So, <clears throat> we're talking of spaces for dissent. I mean, um, Inga brought up some very relevant issues. Um, I'd be hard pushed to find a government that does not, in its rhetoric, promote freedom and democracy and does not, in its practice, actively try and bring it down. That's pretty universal. Um, the levels do vary, but that's par for the course. So within that space, we need to find how we operate. And um, This is uh, the newspaper that I saw at the airport the day I left for Malta. Students protesting for road safety. Um, seems benign enough uh, on, it, on the face of it, but once you realize that this is something that has really crippled the nation, uh, it's a countrywide protest um, which the government doesn't know what to do with, and the students have given an ultimatum that unless their demands are met by the 28th of this month, they will bring the country down. That sounds uh, pretty dramatic. Um, this is not the first time it's happened. It actually, uh, in August 2018, and I will talk about that more, there's a much bigger protest which has quelled um, political goons with the government, uh, physically attacked the students, attacked the journalists, uh, supported by the police, um, and many of them were hurt at that time. Uh, there were rumors uh, that the women had been raped. It was found to be untrue, but the rumors spread. So this picture is of the men protecting the women as, as they're protesting. Uh, and that's, that's generally the space in which I will be talking about, and I will come back to this situation later on in my talk. This um, Albert referred to, uh, and while we're very happy that an investigation is taking place, it's certainly uh, not desirable that journalists be victims because of what they do. Journalism is what they're about. Investigation is what they're meant to be doing. Digging up things is their job. Uh, certainly giving their lives is not part of it, but Malta is by no means the only place. It happens across the globe, and it's, it's problematic. Whenever you're talking truth to power, whenever there are powerful people at the other end, there will be some people who will be paying a price. Uh, and that's, that's always a cause for concern. Uh, this was yesterday, my own government, closing down Al Jazeera because the two journalists, um, uh, David Bergman and Tasneem Khalil, uh, found out that the security advisor to the prime minister had actually used the military intelligence to pick up some people because they were a threat to his wife's company. These are the sort of things that do happen. Um, and while my own government will talk of freedom of press, freedom of expression, this is what happens when you get too close. Uh, and journalists have to tread that line fairly carefully. This is based on certain things that in many countries are being touted. You know, let's have development, let's have prosperity. We can worry about human rights, we can worry about um, 
other issues later. They will come. Uh, and it, it's something that we are sold far too often. Uh, but where does that wealth go to? What does GDP actually mean? If I were to give you uh, a concrete example of what GDP in my country would do, the Sundarbans is the largest mangrove forest in Bangladesh. Uh, in the, it's the largest mangrove forest in the world. Uh, it's a protected, UNESCO protected heritage zone. If tomorrow every tree in the Sundarbans was cut down and the timber sold, it would increase the GDP of my country. I'll leave it to you to decide whether that's wealth my country or not. But that is how GDP is calculated. And I think we need to question these parameters. And when, when wealth does come to a country, who does that wealth go to? And who benefit? What are the gaps left behind? My country came out of a war of liberation. 1971, very bloody war, nine months. Uh, the picture that you see is by the famous uh, photojournalist, Roshib Talukdar. It's the killing fields in Raya very close to where I live. The military knew they were going to lose. They were going to res They surrendered on the 16th of December. But two days before that, they collected the leading intellectuals of my country, the artists, the teachers, the journalists, the thinkers, and killed them and left them in the killing fields. We found them two days later when they, when they surrendered. But this was the way they thought they would leave the country crippled. So this is what we came out with. This is what we grew up with. But artists, at least in my country, have played a very, very important role. They have been the seat of resistance. They are the ones who questioned. They are the ones who have held authority uh, to account. Um, the words actually mean shadhinata, which is freedom. But sadly, we are now at a situation where in my country, the artists are silent. They do not ask questions. Uh, they prefer to keep quiet, wait for better times. I want to remind you all, there are never better times. And better times do not come by themselves. And those spaces for dissent need to be created, need to be protected, need to be nurtured. It doesn't happen by itself. And for me, it's very problematic that the very artists who've given us our liberation are today hiding behind safe zones, being comfortable. And the arguments being used, and I was talking to Mike earlier on about the similarities in many places. The government in power brought us liberation. Yet, having done so, they then expect us to keep quiet when they have those indiscretions because they're the, they're the party who brought us liberation. Therefore, we must not question them. Therefore, we must be forgiving. Therefore, the others who are anti-liberation are the ones we must be against. These are very powerful arguments, supposedly, that are constantly touted to protect people when they're in power who did all the things necessary to come to power. And the problem here is that they forget that the very values that my country was built on, secularism, socialism, democracy, are the very values that they are completely turning asunder when they destroy the institutions, when they break down the judiciary, when they destroy the police, where they corrupt the education system, we forget that they are actually destroyed in the very values that my country was in, made independent for, the very values for which many people sacrificed their lives. I left shortly after independence. I, I went overseas to study. And when I came back, I thought I was coming back to a free country. I discovered that it was then being run by a military dictator, Hussein Mohammad Ashad. Um, the opposition gathered. For once, they were together. They rallied around. I joined the resistance. I was in the streets taking pictures of my struggle for democracy. On the 10th of November 1987, the opposition got together to lay siege to Dhaka City. The government stopped traffic, uh, surrounded the Dhaka City, stopped all traffic to the city to prevent people from all over, all over the country coming in. 
But there was still resistance. And this young man, Nur Hussein, had painted on his back, it says, Gonotan through Muktipak, let democracy be freed. He was killed by police bullets that day, 10th of November, 1987. And that was when I decided to have my first exhibition. Two years later, 10th of November, 1989, I wanted to have a show called The Last Two Years, remembering, paying homage to uh, Nur Hussein. Um, I'm very happy that the, Alliance, that the French government is involved here. I've been working with the Alliance Française, with the British Council, with many of these art organizations. But it's worthwhile remind, reminding you that this show, which was going to be sponsored by the Alliance Française, sponsorship was pulled out because the Alliance Française decided that a show that was so critical of the government wasn't really the right thing to have. 1989, by the way, was the bicentenary of the French Revolution. Just so, remember, so we remember history. But Nur Hussein was killed. He remains an icon of our resistance. <clears throat> this was on the night of the 4th of December, 1990. And that day, Eshad announced on television he was going to step down. He was still in power. He was still the president. But that was enough. That announcement was enough, and everyone came out into the streets. I got on my bicycle, took my camera. I went out to take pictures. And one of the first pictures I took was of this little girl with a bouquet of flowers celebrating democracy with her dad. I don't know where she is. I don't know where he is. But we did get an election. And that was when we had the rude awakening, when we realized that having an election doesn't in itself lead to democracy. So the next picture is quite ironic for me. Um, it's a prison van, a student inside a prison van. These are students from the university who've been corralled and put in there and are going to go to jail because these are students who voted the other way. They are pro-opposition students. Uh, it's ironic because I myself found myself inside one of those prison vans um, not so long ago. I'll come, come to that. So what we decided to do, uh, and this is not a PowerPoint with graphics, uh, but I will use this one, one illustration, because I decided that um, as an artist, as a cultural practitioner, I needed to find ways to get out of this. Uh, and one of the things I decided I would do as a practitioner was not merely practice as an artist, but set up the platforms that would help other artists uh, produce work and resist. And we looked at a model that had three elements, media, education, and culture. And the first entity we set up was an agency called DRIG. Uh, it's the Sanskrit word for vision. So it was a platform for storytellers who would tell the stories. Because I was very concerned by the fact that countries like mine, which I others called developing countries or least developed countries, and I call majority world countries because that's who we are, the majority of the world, um, are very poorly represented. We're known largely as icons of poverty. Yet the beauty of our culture, the struggles that we go through are not celebrated. So Dhrik was set up and then later we needed soldiers. We set up a school, a media school, which has since become a very well-known school of photography. Batshala. And later, once these two entities were there, we set up the festival that I'm going to talk to you about, which was the cultural element. And the idea really was that through media, education, and culture, we would exert pressure upon the political space so politicians could not get away with their indiscretions. So the people who were governed had a say in the process of governance. Uh, so that was the plan. And I'll now show you uh, a little clip from the festival we began in 2000, and we had the most recent one uh, just finished in February. The significance of Chobi Mala goes far beyond photography. It's about challenging certain stereotypes. It's about recognizing that a vast cultural difference exists, which is embedded within political differences. And what Chobi Mala tries to do is to address those political inequalities through culture. The very way it began was exciting. Um, right at the beginning, we had an abortive attempt 
in 1995, but when we really began in 2000, the first thing that happened was a closure. We were going to have this exhibition at the museum, and of course the government wanted to censor our show. Um, taking a show out of a museum is not quite so easy, particularly at midnight. But we opened at Zurich, and the very same people who were meant to open the show originally, our famous poet Shamsur Rahman, came and opened the show at Zurich. The government had egg on its face, had to explain why they showed, shut the show down. But that was their problem. And we've continued ever since. Uh, of course, we've worked with the government as well. Um, but we've had this huge, wonderful range of photographers. There you see Reza with his Lumix camera. Um, we've gone back to the National Museum. We've had shows there. We've had shows in the major places all across Bangladesh. But of course, we've also taken the show out of museums, out of gallery spaces, to the public. We've had a phenomenal range of work. The greats like Salgado and Reza and Martin Parr and Raghu Rai have all showed, but also young emerging photographers, people who, in some cases, who actually made their mark through photography. This was, for many people, the first opportunity they ever had. And they've all gone, well, many of them have gone, gone on to become superstars. We've dealt with bureaucracy. We've dealt with lack of resources. Uh, we've dealt with the problems of our own limitations. But that has never been something to stop us. The themes we used, things like resistance, boundaries, um, exclusion, were, of course, all themes to do with the social significance of, of our work, the type of work we wanted to present, the things we stood for. But it's evolved there as well. And we've taken shows to football fields, set them up uh, in unusual places. But we've also engaged with the public in a very different way. Uh, we've involved the participants, we've involved a global public, we've involved the internet, we've used social media, all to produce a much more inclusive process. And today, what Chobi Mela has become is something that's not determined by a small group of people in Bangladesh. It's a festival that belongs to the world. Chobi Mela is big. It's a big experience. It's a big event. <laughs> Chobi Mela is a very different event. Um, it's not at all like other festivals. The time it was taking place, the streets of Dhaka was, on, was in flames. A political party was trying to hang on to power through means which the people considered um, illegal and unfair. And there were protests, there were violence, there was violence in the streets. Our struggles include these political struggles that we're embedded in. To be able to perform within that spectrum, it's also evidence of Drake's resilience that we were able to pull off a major international festival at a time when most things in Bangladesh were being switched off, the tap was being switched off. <laughs> present at the very first edition in the year 2000 and I have seen the festival grow and mature and become a very diverse and very rich and dense cultural event. The arrangement of international Chobi Mala vouches for Drake's urge to connect to the spirit of higher expression of the people the world over which in turn connects all of us in the same movement to reveal our aspirations to attain a better, a higher, 
আমার মতো যাতে গ্রামের আরো ছেলে মেয়েদেরকে এরকম সুযোগ দেওয়া হয় ফটোগ্রাফি করার জন্য well what i'm trying to get to is the government is an important player uh, and we need to engage with them and as you will have noticed we we did have uh, the caretaker government's um, advisor there over a period of time the big galleries are government spaces uh, when we first wanted to have our show uh, places like the alliance and the british council and the goethe institute were the only places where we could potentially show but there again we still had those same problems i mean if if your work is political if your work is threatening then others decide whether you can show or not so that was when we decided to show our own work um there were some decisions which we made very early one was that the rick the agency was not going to be an ngo it was not going to be a funded organization we would try and provide professional services uh and then for ourselves we we do work with NGOs we work with donor organizations we take on contractual work for which we deliver but the it it gives us a different work ethics and we work along those lines but even with the government we felt uh, we were not anti government by any means we wanted to work with the government but ensure that the government did what it was intended to so once the festival became raised to a certain level we decided to invite the president of the country to open the show and he read which was rather nice and a by product of that is that when the president comes you get to write the president's speech which is pretty useful um and if you're crafty enough you can write a good speech through which you get the president to say the things you want the president to say uh which is also rather convenient uh, it was had other problems in the sense having been anti establishment for so long to actually be standing next to the president is is one of the things that then you have to ask your question have you sold out is there a deal what's going to happen are you con- going to continue resisting have you uh, you know where have you compromised yourself but that was one and we did it once and we didn't need to do it again we we proved our point um but we went on to show work in other ways and the next picture is one which uh, you'll notice the letters in red on the top of the billboard it says arnoy no more it's a campaign we called the no more campaign understandably things which think we should not tolerate in society and that billboard uh, was deliberately chosen because uh, we were working against the garment industry we knew of the fires that had taken place and the photograph is a photograph of the carcass of a building uh, of a garment factory where many workers had died so because the garment industry uses billboards for fashion we decided to take on those very billboards for our show so we showed that and the building at the back is the office of the garment owners association so it was very strategically placed we actually had a performance there and um uh, while all this is going on i mean you might sort of feel that uh i'm suggesting that uh, our government is not appreciative of the arts that they don't give us attention uh, far from the truth well when certainly we showed this work we got immediate attention yeah and, i mean you can't complain you're not getting attention in this sort of a situation and that's that's the sort of thing that does happen from now and every now and then but i'll i'll move forward a little bit from there um coming to the festival we just had shortly before that i showed you the student movement in august 2018 again the students were in the streets and they were being beaten up by armed goons under protection by the police so i was there as a journalist reporting um i was doing live on facebook i gave a, an interview to al jazeera and on the night of the 5th of august um a large number of security people came into our flat i i got arrested i got handcuffed blindfolded i was taken in and tortured and that went on now i'm saying this about a particular regime but in fact that's what's happened with every regime i've had uh, against the military government i've had uh, appointed 
uh, a loaded gun pointed to my face and extorted. Uh, this is one of eight knife wounds I got during the next government. This government puts me in jail. So they're fairly democratic. They all, you know, give me equal space. Uh, uh, but in this particular situation, when I'm arrested, what did happen was a massive movement across the globe uh, for my release. And These murals were quite interesting because uh, the Prime Minister at that time was visiting Kathmandu for the Sark Summit and they had the entire city plastered with large posters. They projected this image across the hotel that the Prime Minister was staying in. I was on every front page. They managed to get the newspaper, heard the newspaper she was receiving every morning, delivered in that way, and it, it was blitz, really, uh, very, very effectively done. Then in, in many other countries, there were massive campaigns. Uh, in New York, um, the Prime Minister was there for the uh, UNGA meeting. So there, they, they gathered round. Sharon Stone came and spoke there. And a whole range of people. It was really quite phenomenal. Uh, what they also did, and one of one of the people we'd worked with, Wasfia Nasreen, she, not being satisfied by that, um, flew a plane, circled the UN building uh, with that sign around there. So there's no way they could escape it. They could certainly not ignore it. Um, but also, I mean, the sheer number of people who'd resisted, I mean, there were about um, over a, well over a dozen Nobel laureates who signed the declaration. Uh, many other people like Sharon Stone and others that I mentioned. Uh, some people I knew, but, you know, Richard Branson, I mean, I have never seen him, never had any, we live in different worlds, I don't even know he's an activist, but he was one of the people who signed, so it was really massive. Uh, it was, um, and the government didn't know what the hell was going on. But what happened after that is, that at the Oxford debates, uh, the advisor to the government, Gohar Rizvi, he was invited. Um, and he mentioned that oh, Shahidul was not um, arrested because of his um, interview on Al Jazeera. It was because he was inciting violence. Now, the fact that I was recording the violence makes it slightly difficult. I mean, I don't have a time machine. So, you know, for me to have been inciting violence, which I was recording, uh, there's a logic somewhere. That's, um, so at the Oxford debate, um, this has been happening, and the advisor, Gohariz, we talks about how it has nothing to do with Al Jazeera, it's this inciting violence. And then a very interesting thing happens. Um, <laughs> the policeman who's in charge of having arrested me gets rewarded. And on the police, um, on the book, uh, on uh, the justification for it, it very clearly says, 
because of Shahid al um, conversation interview on Al Jazeera, for his bravery at having, by the way, this is about 35 police officers, come in, comes into my house, unarmed person, takes me away, bravery, very brave, um, and this person gets rewarded by, by the government. So they, they've got their own information uh, a little bit skewed up. But while all that's going on, um, let me go back to the issues we were talking about. Now, as a result of this, uh, obviously, it's, it's, it's a warning. Uh, the message is, if we can get Shahid al-Alam, we can get you. And uh, shortly before that, the Chief Justice had been sent on exile at gunpoint. Um, so there are very strong messages that are being put. What happens now is I'm in jail. The festival is coming up. We take about 18 months to prepare for this festival. A lot has been. So we're at a situation where we don't really know if this festival will go on. So the first decision, and I, I, I'm not largely responsible for it, it's my colleagues outside who decided that the show would go on. Uh, it was going to be a lot more difficult. When we started, um, we had l not that many supporters from within the country. It was largely outside. When we spoke to companies like Canon and Nikon, it was very difficult convincing them to support a festival because they worried about how many cameras they were going to sell. Um, we were able to turn it around to create a credibility where they wanted to be on that table. They wanted to be associated with a name like Chobimala. But, uh, and over a period of time, we were able to create a situation where uh, most of the sponsorship was from Bangladesh. But on this particular occasion, the Bangladeshi corporate world just did not. I mean, we were too hot to, we were toxic. No one wanted to touch us. Except for that one company, Novo Air, which stayed with us. Perhaps it's significant that the chairman's wife is an ex-student of the school and is now a teacher, but we'll never, we won't mention that. Drik and Pachala are the two core organizations. The reason we can do a festival like this is because we put in a lot of people power. A large part of the cost is sweat, basically. Um, and we can do it at relatively low cost, but even so, you do need sponsorship. This time, obviously, we didn't have the government venues, so we turned the thing around. We, were, we took a building under construction as our main site. Um, and we, we had incredible work done because we were able to use, we had so much freedom in this building under construction. We could do what the hell we wanted. There was a car lift, which was a huge shaft, which we were able to use interestingly, and all those sort of things. But the reality was, except for this one Bangladeshi company, None of the other organizations uh, were prepared to. In fact, one managing director from a multinational company rang me from a landline to say, I'm scared of responding to your phone call. Please don't call me. Yeah, so that's the sort of situation we're in. But let me then go on. We, we decided to do it. But we knew we were going to be under threat. Uh, so one of the things we decided we would do is we would have a really powerful advisory board. So the people we have here, um, Kunda Dixit is one of the best known journalists in South Asia. Professor Rehman Saban, the next from the left, is our most respected academic. The next person is actually the sister of a person we are giving the Lifetime Achievement Award to. And we were critical of the government because these awards are generally given to cronies, to people who are close to the government in some way. So important people who are meant, to, who should be getting the award are not getting it. So rather than simply critique the government, we decided we would provide that award ourselves. So the gentleman has passed away, but his sister is collecting the award. And what we do is we provide, a, rather than give money to the person, and he's died anyway, give money to the person, we provide a scholarship, and you will have seen in the video, uh, one of the recipients earlier, uh, a scholarship to a deserving student who would not otherwise be able to afford to go to art classes. Um, uh, so a student gets an award, this person gets 
um, you know, get recognized and respected. And we don't actually lose money because it's an internal transfer from one department to the other. Um, so it works quite well. Uh, Raghu Rai, who's next, is South Asia's most well-known uh, photographer. He's a very early Magnum photographer. And the woman on the right, Beth Citron, is from the Rubin Museum uh, in New York, who are going to do my retrospective in November. So we also have a major museum uh, coming over, talking about how they're going to work with us. So this happens. But these are the people who were present. Uh, those who were not present on the stage included people like Omar Tushen, the Nobel laureate. So if you've got people of that stature on your letterhead, it gives you a credibility, but it also makes it more difficult to, to shut down. But uh, I'll come to that story regardless. Um, what we also did was we used that um, constru under construction space to do uh, a lot of um, interesting work. These are students. We have a lot of work with students. But you'll notice the rods on the corner. This is the building material we've actually used to create some of our installations. Um, what we also did, this is uh, Onohitha uh, Majumdar from the editor of Himal magazine from Sri Lanka. And we are right now at a very dangerous situation in South Asia where India and Pakistan, the two nuclear nations, are, have been bombing one another. So this was a, an expression of solidarity amongst artists uh, speaking for peace in this, in this forum. The next one is Roku Rai giving a talk. And he, as you can see, you know, uh, it's not a big space. Uh, but it's completely packed, people are on the seats, some are sitting on the stage itself because we don't have enough room. Uh, we've continued the other things we do, which is the open air exhibits. And these are exhibits that go to football fields, school playgrounds, marketplaces, uh, exhibitions are elitist things, um, galleries at least, major m museums, galleries are elitist spaces where many people will be uncomfortable going the average person. So if people will not come to the gallery, we've decided the gallery will go to the people. So we've turned that thing around and rickshaws are a very common mode of transport. So this has become very popular. We've done it on bullock carts, we've done it on elephants, on boats. We've exported this thing. We've, we've actually uh, taken it to other countries where we've done these shows on camels and trucks. So it, it's uh, interesting. What we also have is a very interesting set of discussions, talks. Um, and the first set of talks we had was on freedom of expression and freedom of thought. So that too is one of the ways in which we are trying to address some of these issues. So having a major event where you have leading thinkers from the region come over, talk about freedom of expression, freedom of thought, and it's on the front page of every major newspaper and it's on television the following day is a very strong message to get across, particularly when it's being organized by people you've been trying to shut down. Uh, one of the key highlights was a conversation with Arundhati Roy. Uh, that also led to a very interesting situation because Arundhati, when I asked her, I mean, we, we've known each other for some time, but when I asked her, uh, she said, who are your sponsors? And she wasn't going to participate if there were certain types of sponsors. It was good for us, because it meant we had to then be careful about who we were taking money from. Um, so those are interesting things that we did. Um, but what the government also did was, they try, again, if someone like Arundhati is coming, then you need a, a hall that seats over a 1,000 people. Uh, now, that's not easy to find. Um, so we hired a government place. Uh, they gave us permission, but withdrew the permission the night before the event, yeah? uh, thinking we could not regroup. Uh, we were able to regroup. And interestingly enough, I was mentioning this to Inga, the way we got this other place was through a contact I'd made while I was in jail. <laughs> so, you know, you used all the tricks in the book. But the jail experience itself was also interesting because... You know, while I'm there, we're having to design uh, 
a major festival with a festival director inside jail. And, you know, I'm getting jail visits and it's very difficult getting information across and whatever. Uh, we, we have sign, sign language and other things. We, we try and get that mess, uh, information across. I try and tell them who to go to, who to meet, where you're going to find the sponsorship and all those sort of things. But something interesting has happened. At, at my stage at, in my career, it's not very difficult for me to take on residencies. You, know, you can't, I mean, I'm running three institutions. Uh, I can't take that time off. I can't go away for three months, six months somewhere. I ended up three months in jail. It was an interesting residency. <laughs> and in fact, what I did while I was there is I decided to use it. I started photography classes inside jail. Um, I didn't have a camera. You're not allowed to have the camera. I managed to convince the guy who takes the mug shots of the prisoners to lend us his camera. He became one of the students and we had these classes. We, in those 100 days, I was there for 107 days. In those 100 days, we had 40 murals painted all inside the jail walls, some of them 32 feet wide, by, by prisoners themselves. And the place looks radically different now. They said they wanted musical instruments. We were able to convince some of the jailers were musicians, so we asked them to join in, and uh, they set up a band with both prisoners and wardens. Uh, and on the 16th of December, which is our victory day, they had their first concert inside the jail with the musical instruments I was able to give them. Uh, one of the prisoners has informed me that he's written 20 new songs. We started adult literacy classes. We had vegetable patches. So this whole thing went on while I was in jail. Uh, that's probably why they let me out, but anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so I remember these here in this, in this new place which we've got through our jail contact. And what happened was there were so many people outside this new place that the government didn't know. And there was a major statement ma made by all the leading intellectuals. And that's interesting for another reason, because we have been living in a climate of fear. And while this resistance was going on, a lot of it was outside. Within the country, it was very dangerous, though we did see some important exceptions. But this was a time when people felt enough was enough. So this Arundhati's talk being closed down was something that everyone came out in protest against. And eventually, we were allowed to go ahead. Uh, and it was completely packed out. It went really well. Um, and you know, in most events, uh, people invite ministers to do openings and launches, because that's when you get them, at least in my country. If you get a minister, then the media comes. Otherwise, they don't generally come. But here's an event where we get more media coverage than anyone's ever got, when there's no minister in sight. And in fact, the minister would have had to ask us permission to attend uh, this event. So that was quite interesting. Talking of ministers, by the way, while this is going on, we get an emissary from the prime minister asking if she could meet Arundhati for 15 minutes. So Arundhati then quite intelligently says, well, I'd love to meet the prime minister, but I've come on Chobimala's invitation. So if I come, I come with Shahil. So we get another response. Well, it would be a little bit embarrassing for me to meet you in his company, maybe some other time. Uh, but they've, still the power structures are, are, do change a little bit. And we've before been reviewed by New York Times and other people as the world's most demographically diverse festival. This time, the news in the New York Times was slightly different. Um, so that really, the, the festival itself became an act of defiance. And what has since become very, very interesting is that that is seen as a symbol of defiance by even other people. Uh, the fact that we were able to do something like Chobimala when we had such difficulty, when the money was pulled out, when venues were unavailable, uh, was really something that gave us a lot of strength. And I'll end with um, a message um, that I think I'd like to leave you with. This is not something I'm saying for the first time. 
it's not something you've been saying for the first time because earlier on today when you were doing the introductions and you were asked about who you admired and what attribute they had which you admired, time and time again, several of you talked about bravery, about courage. And I think while fear is contagious, so is courage. And that's the message I'd like to leave you with. Thank you.